Welcome, everyone. We are back for another special podcast. This man has a special place in my heart. This is episode one, number 84 from uh, my man is all over the world. I don't even know where you are at the moment. We just did the GG Super Millions. It's Philip Gruesome, known as Phil Board, just won $806,000 from $150 buy in the GG Master, 66,000 plus entries. I could go on and on about the accolades, my friend, but. How are you? Good to see you again. We just spent three and a half, four hours the other day doing a show together, but it's good to see you again. Thank you, guys. Hello, hello, hello. Hi, Jeff. Uh, hello to the viewers. Nice to be yes. back. Well, it, it's great to have you. There's so much to talk about. I do want to thank our sponsor, Club GG, where you can play with your friends and have clubs for free and win hundreds of thousands of dollars in prizes monthly. That is our sponsor. And now the fun stuff, Phil. You're fresh. You got to, you got to, I mean, I, I was expecting a tattoo of gg on you just won, <laughs> from 150 dollars you you won eight hundred thousand dollars i said a month ago and now you just got 800k for for basically i don't even know if that's a real buy-in that's like a, a drop in the bucket what happened tell me about this tournament first off <laughs> yeah i feel like i won the lottery you know one one bullet like such a trip you know sixty five thousand uh runners you know, and I, I mean, I won a lot of tournaments in my life, but this one was really special, really, really special. <laughs> of course, my, you know, also my biggest score, you know, in terms of my own, uh, you know, uh, share, you know, and yeah. uh, just amazing. Yeah, yeah tell me, because you played $100,000 buy-ins and we've played in the same Alpha 8s back, you know, was this 2013, 2014, when that series started, you've, you've won millions of dollars in tournaments over 11 million. And, and, and earnings as we we do see here i mean i'll, I'll flash back over uh to this but you know what what is uh how does this compare to let's just take like one of your biggest ones ever this 25k in monte carlo tell me because that's it that's the that's a big difference though 150 dollars for 800 versus a 25k for 1.3 where you know you have action pieces this that and the other so yeah that was that that was actually your largest poker win ever yeah, so this one I had 100% myself all the way to the end, no deal. And in the other tournaments, I don't know how much I had there, you know, but probably like three, 400,000 uh, was, my, was my biggest score for myself, you know? <clears throat> wow. Yeah, it's pretty, so, pretty, pretty amazing. And, and uh, you know, Phil, tell me how you got started in poker. And you, uh, from, uh, I believe, if, again, Krefeld or... Krefeld in Germany or you're a small town I imagine I've never heard of that in Germany you're you know born and raised there how did you get into poker what 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 started you in the poker yeah my friend came up to me and was like hey I have this poker website pokerstrategy.com back in the days you know and uh, I said like hey I got $50 and I made like a couple hundred out of it just following this chart that they give you for 20 big black cash game you know, and I, I got curious, you know, and I got right away into tournaments, one dollar tournaments, you know, and lost a couple, couple shots, you know, like put some of my own money in, lost a couple hundred bucks. And then I read the first book, you know, and uh, I closed the book and I win the first two hundred dollar in a one two dollar tournament, you know. Wow. And, uh, I, I say this was my biggest win because this really got me into like, okay, you read a book, you make money, like you study it and then you win more. Like, okay. And then I bought all the books, read all the books, you know, and like back in the days, you know, there were no, no solvers, there were books. And I remember yeah. I calculated the first like four bet, you know, I started with this four bet bluffing and I calculated on a piece of paper, you know, like, <laughs> And, and and what year was this? What so what are you talking? You're born eighty seven. you what year did you start playing poker? So this must be I was like seventeen when I got to know about poker. Yeah, and then uh it kicked really in with like eighteen, nineteen, you know. So you're talking two thousand four, talking online. Here your first ever result. It's actually in Macau, kind of crazy. It's far. Maybe you played a couple before it didn't cash, but your first ever cash is actually a win. What was this like to, to go to Hong Kong and, and win a win a tournament actually to take first? Yeah, it's crazy because my first tournament actually doesn't show here. And that was in Germany, also like a seven hundred dollar tournament where I came first place and I uh, met Igor, Igor Kuganov. 
my first trip, you know, and we became friends. I busted him. And uh, yeah, from, from that point on, it just went up like uh, very quickly. And, and looking back now and to, to where poker is today and where it is then, what would be some advice to players? I know you started a poker stable, which I want to talk to you about as well, but how, it's changed so much. There's so much more information. The, the quality of player is so much stronger. I'd say the beginning information, people are starting out with more information. Um, how, would you, how would you recommend to someone to get into poker if they want to play for a living these days versus, you know, kind of how it was, right? It was a completely different time when you were like 20 years ago or, or 15, mm. you know, 15, 20 years ago. Mm. I feel like it's still the most important thing is to, to really want it. You know, to really want to to become a professional and to to make sure that you want this lifestyle. You know, it, it's I'm I'm saying poker is about freedom, right? Like financial freedom, but then also like emotion, being free of emotional baggage. You know, and and so on and so on. It's it's a lot about freedom, freedom from the nine to five job, freedom from a boss freedom to travel, you know? Is that what you really want so much that you're willing to go through all the struggles of a poker player? Because it's it's tough, you know? It's like my uh, physically tough, you know? I'm still, <laughs> I'm still repairing the damage from 10 years on the laptop and in the casino, <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, it's tough, you know? And you're challenging yourself really in, in any way, physically, emotionally, mentally and it's not for everybody everybody can make it that's the cool thing about poker but you have to really be willing to take some pain you know but yeah and, and you know i know you well first of all a very cool side note you were with me the only person who was next to me when i met my wife at burning man in 2014 so that is we're energetically very connected that was a that was a wild moment your bike actually didn't work and i stayed behind with you while everyone rode off to a to a uh thing at seven in the morning i think it was to like a a, a, mm -hmm. a burn right the man embrace statue so that's a pretty cool memory right if you're and that, that's a big thing about like poker variants and life lessons you know like i think about this every day about variance and and chance and this is something i feel like in poker you get a high amount of these things how you deal with success how you deal with failure how you deal with the river card you know you, you get a lot of like life lessons in a very short sample that makes you kind of grow up fast and also with you know crypto or stock markets or businesses that fail or covid happens you start looking at life and you're like hey like you know i'm i think that's one of the big advantages of poker players if you're able to, to deal with this type of the, the highs and lows come at you quickly and you have to kind of be able to detach from something that goes well or doesn't go well because it's uh it's not easy you know if you're in the real real world and the stock market collapses in like a quick period you know you may you may lose your mind or not be able to handle it as a poker player you know you lose 30% or 40% of your net worth in a day. You're like, all right, like back, you know, <laughs> readjust the stakes. I try again tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. So that is a, that is a pretty big skill set, I think, advantage over many people. And again, there's people that don't do well with that, with bankroll management or make big mistakes anyway. But I just think there is a lot of learnings and you know, kind of long-winded way of saying that there's a lot of lessons and, and teachings in poker. And, and I think that you uh, are on the same way, same way linked with that. And as we spoke on the GG Super Million show, we did a four-hour final table, a special edition one on just the other day. So we talk a little bit about this stuff. But tell me a little bit about your um, overall philosophy with poker and life and what you feel you've, you've sort of taken so far in, in being a professional poker player. Yeah, I think exactly what you say. You know, I'm, I'm at some point, I said like poker is like a guru, like a tough guru, you know. And any any problem I will encounter in poker, I will I have the same problem in life, but I can experience it in a lot more playful way and uh, in a faster in a faster yeah. way, right? Like, and uh, ever since I made poker about like learning about life, it got it had a different quality. You know, first it was all about the money and and financial freedom. But then it was like more about like my emotional, spiritual development, you know, and I think that's the way to go. That's the way to go and how to uh, get over all these like uh, tough times.
you know, because they do happen for a reason. It was also so crazy with that tournament, you know, the, the weeks before the tournament, I made a couple of huge mistakes in big spots, right? And then they came up again in that tournament, like exactly the same spot. And I was like, no, 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 I'm not doing that shit anymore. <laughs> you know, and kind of dodged it. So it kind of all led up to this big score, you know? So sometimes we have to get a tough lesson for, for later in life, you know? But would you say in, in a little bit, can you tell me about your stable? Cause I want to make sure we cover this. I know this is something kind of new that you're doing and, and you've had some experience in playing the highest, the high rollers and, you know, selling action or being staked or different deals along the way. You know, what have you learned from, from that, from being on both sides? Maybe you're, you've been staked or you're getting staked or you stake people. So tell, tell me some uh, important criteria you look at when you're looking at be, doing investments with players. Uh, yeah, I've done it all my life. I've always been staked. I always stake people. I always had horses, but now I have uh, set it up really professionally with a team, you know, with an emotional coach, with poker coach, yeah, with a professional accounting and so on. And uh, I really love this project, you know, because I, I love to share. I actually love more to share about poker than playing it nowadays, you know, and. Uh, what I'm looking in, in staking, in staking people is definitely th that they have a certain openness to like a deeper, deeper ways of seeing this whole poker game, right? If they they see it as a as a guru, as a life lesson, you know, it's much easier with them to teach them. If they if they are emotion, if they're able to work on their emotions, I can fix it really, really quickly. You know, like let's say I can I can look at somebody's stats and see like, oh, they don't love the river enough, right? Like now I can show them like a hundred different spots and make them study all the river spots so they feel like, okay, I can do it. Or I can go and say like, what are you afraid of? Are you afraid to look stupid when you bluff and the guy calls you? You look stupid. Or you don't want to be owned, you know, or you want to be better than the others, you know. And then I fix all the spots at once. If he gets over that fear and if he starts like, okay, sometimes I bluff and sometimes I get called, you know, I'm not stupid and it's not like wasting money, you know. I'm not afraid of that anymore. I can handle that emotion. You know? Right. Then it's right. You could, also, you could also argue you could you, you could explain to someone it's you look stupid not to bluff, right? You have these these cards in your hand. This is the line. If you don't bluff, it's actually like the wrong. You know what I mean? Like that's that's another way of looking at it. But I think that is that is a that is a good way to uh, prefix it. And do you and is that how? What's your like? Do you want a massive stable? Are you trying to focus on a core? I think you said you have eight or so. Like, what is your target within staking, and what are, what are you looking to get out of it? No, now we're running smooth on eight, and that's just like preparation for scale for uh, taking on a lot of players. And I want to focus a lot on uh, the guys, like kind of like they are in a job, but they play a lot already, and they are thinking, "Oh, can I quit the job and jump into poker?" And say, "Yes, you can. Come to us." We, we fix you up, we, we hook you up with all the good stuff, and yes, you can do it, you know. Because I think there's many, there's many out there, they just need to put some uh, some time into it and some and get some solid trust, you know, that like, yes, you can do it, and then they feel safe in an, in an environment like that, you know. And, and what is the typical buy-in size you're looking to stake for? Does it depend on the skill level? Like, are you willing, is it main events? Is it online, live, a mixture, World Series? Like, what are, what are you looking to do for a stake? Anybody who comes to us, we stake them online and live, you know. <clears throat> we're, we're putting uh, yeah, so much attention into the poker game in general and the emotional stuff. Um, anything, we're staking from 5 to 3K dollar, 5K dollar, kind of right now you know so we're only like higher players we would take winning players and want to make them like world class you know um but on the lower lower stakes players i think there's lots of room to take people who have a decent understanding and losing a little bit to kick them off and into uh, the winning zone you know for sure and and are you 
are you, would you say right now in terms of your poker career, yeah, could you maybe walk me through as we look at the, the head and mob, just kind of quickly, you know, go through. So you were playing online in what, 04, 05 even, like 17 years old. And then you really didn't play. Because even after this score in 19 or in 2009, it looks like you didn't really play in 2010 and sort of in 11, right, is when you, like what, what changed here between this period of time where you first played a little live, nothing in 2010, and then April 11, like what, what, what shifted for you here to start playing high rollers and, and traveling and playing the circuit? Yeah, I think in this period, I was grinding like 24 seven, like every, every night, every night I was playing, running on Red Bull and pizza. And, uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and just playing it, you know, and I became like the most successful on player. They had the five. I, I remember I was in university playing 5k turbo sitting goals, you know, back in the days already before I even start like the playing the high rollers live. <clears throat> and and, and, just, and did someone to me in this live was it a friend or who like told you to like what, what decided for you to start playing to go live though? To just be like, yeah, I'm gonna go fire high stakes live poker and travel. Like, did you was a bankroll? Was it just you are now old enough? I guess at, at 2004, I mean, you were you were already kind of what 18, 17, 18, and 04, and then like why here? What what shifted for you right here in 11? Yeah, I guess like my, I don't know, I don't know what happened. Maybe some satellites, you know, um, and I had some. I won a satellite and played a tournament and had so much fun, you know, and met some cool people, you know, and then slowly got into the live game. It was super cool because I played 25k in, in Vegas. I know everybody on the table, and nobody knew who I was. Like I was completely undercover, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's it's a nice advantage, right? It cha things change, especially on the high stakes circuit. We kind of get to know people. You sort of you, you, the secrets out, but in some of these bigger field tournaments and. You know, when you're unknown, it is an advantage, especially if you know them a bit and they don't know you. And, you know, it, it is fun. And you have that. I mean, you had you really did go on one of the sicker runs, right? Alpha A, I think you won three, two at least. I mean, I was there for two of them. I'm trying to trying to find uh, was it 2013, right? Uh, or 12, 11. <laughs> Funny, you were, you were there. In my big moments, you were also there. Huh? <laughs> in my biggest moment of my life you were there so that's you know there's something about that energy is powerful man I, I i i it is very cool it's cool to see it, it's it's really to me it's fun to see poker kind of go full circle too like to go the ups and downs you find like the top you know experience some different spots and, and get a lot of experience it sounds like you know you've been on some runs right i think you've shared you had uh if i'm not mistaken you know you did you said i, I have you quoted saying that you got a little bit arrogant at a time is that is that true do you feel like at some point you got a little cocky got a little cavalier with the money and what was going on taking it for granted was that a was that a fair statement for a part of your poker career oh yeah yeah like probably then after the second uh alpha eight win you know then i became like a little flying too high you know like a bit again like i stopped studying at all you know and playing less starting less and uh, the guys catch up very quick, you know. It's crazy, you know. I was very good at the time, and then they catched up so quick, you know, and I, I wouldn't recognize that, you know. And for yeah, me, also, the, the soul was, I was a very intuitive player always, and uh, then the soul was came out, you know, and I was like, ah, yeah, yeah, okay. You know, I, I, I knew nothing about it, first of all. I got to know it much later. And uh, yeah, got really uh, out of hand, you know. It was a very uh, big, huge downswing. At first, I was arrogant, and then I kept losing, and then I lost complete confidence. Also, so it shifted in both bad ways, you know. And, and but how much uh, of it do you think was yeah. how much of it do you think was luck or variance, let's call it, versus that really people just got got better? Because even in these like Saint Kitts, you know, what are we talking twenty? 30 person tournaments, they were hundred Ks, um, you know, winning it might, you might not play great and win a tournament or you might be playing great and not. So, you know, how, how would, how much of it do you think was, was it a mix or do you think you actually were just not playing your best, maybe, you know, coming late or not focusing? What, what do you, what do you attribute to the sort of uh, shift in that period of time? 
it's kind of a deep question, you know, like, uh, I believe a lot in self-sabotage, you know, like, something inside of you doesn't really want to win because let, let's say I keep winning, you know, and then I think I'm like the, the best uh, guy in the world, you know, and like, and uh, listening to me, this is how we do it, you know. And instead I went into this downswing, which in the end also got me into very tough emotional times. And then I had this huge awakening kind of shift at the end of that where I completely like started seeing reality differently, you know, and it was a beautiful a moment, but I felt that I first had to face like all the dark emotions, all the difficult emotions, you know, to get over that and then switch into a new way, you know, and, and being more open to this whole emotional, energetical stuff, you know, um, yeah. It was like next level. So I was sabotaging myself to go down, to get to the point to change something. You know? That's why I'm saying it's so important to always work on yourself emotionally that you're not having to lose everything. Right. And if you could take one lesson to where you are now, obviously having the biggest score of your career proportionately or actually the most money that you've won, which is kind of crazy because you're not you know, playing an intensive schedule or haven't been. So to have this success and have this extra score, but what would be a lesson? You know, take your prime, you, your peak. You, you win the Alpha Eights. You know, you win a bunch of money. Is there anything you would? Would you have taken a break when it started to go not good? You, you would give some advice to yourself that maybe others that are having success that are out there that are that are winning, finding they're doing in cash games or or uh, tournaments. You know, when you do, is it to lock up some of the money? You know, invest more or tuck it away like give me give me some advice you would have given yourself because it's hard right it's hard because if you're crushing you're in your mind you're playing good it's like you just you almost want to play more when's the next big tournament what's the next stakes i can play like i i i'm you know i'm killing it right like that's kind of the problem in, in this this game too it's like finding balance understanding what's really going on you know the right bankroll management risk all these things it's not easy you know like i, I was saying about the attributes right like a player card in fifa you know, bankroll management, sleep, uh, side vices, you know, at the pits, or there's a lot of things, your friends, yeah. investments, like how much money you probably invested in coffee shops or, you know, startups or crypto, like your shit, you probably, you, you probably got seven figures and dusted random stuff, right? Or things you came and you're just like throwing money here and there, staking your buddy in a tournament, like, you know, buy, buying 20, <laughs> 10,000 of a 25K of people. I feel like guilty of all of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, really have an investment in a coffee company. <laughs> I do too, which isn't bad. They can work. I'm just saying, it's like yeah, you, you it's start not, doing everything. That one is not that, at least. <laughs> you know? uh, but yeah, I think all of the things you say are really great advice. Don't invest so much into like random startups and your friends and so on. Put some money aside into like safe things. I, I like gold, I like real estate and gold a little bit, you know diversify, you know, because you never know what's going to happen, you know, a bit of crypto, a bit of gold, a bit of real estate, a couple of stocks with good stocks, you know, and then you're quite safe, but nothing is really safe. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, that's a whole nother conversation. And, but looking back though, do you wish you took different times? Would you have shifted your deals? Like when you're really hot, like to, to take more off the table, let people take the risk where they stake you fully or was that still, you had people staking you and it was more like the money you were winning, you were risking or doing things with? Like, you know, you know what I mean? Like, do you, do you feel that you maybe risk too much your own money at times? Is that, was that one of the things where you put too much into play and not secured yeah. enough or, or how, like that? It's always interesting to me because this is, I think this is like the hardest part is like when you actually have a success, how to manage it. Similar to like an athlete. Now there's NIL. I don't know if you're familiar with this uh, name, image, likeness in the U.S., so like for a hundred years plus in the college, no athletes get money. The biggest college stars, no money. It's all like, you know, there's some under the table money in this and that, but now it's like college kids are making millions of dollars in sports. They may never even go pro, but the local kid at Oklahoma or Michigan is getting car dealerships and you know, they're 18, 19, 17, getting, getting Ferraris. They're, they're getting a lot of money, but like what experience, you know, you, you're not ready for that. Like you don't know what you're doing. You don't know how to save. You have no 
uh, experience. So I think that's like a very hard part is when you kind of get immediate success or you don't have the right guidance and mentors, there's, it's really difficult to make decisions. Like, cause you just don't know, you know? So yeah, it's so hard to make money and it's, it's so hard to make money. It's so hard to keep it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. You're getting told, you're getting told now, if you don't spend the money, inflation will eat it up. You know, if you don't do that, like, it's almost like you're getting pressured into doing stuff. Like it's, yeah, it's, it's a bit chaotic, right? It's a little bit hard. Yeah. Right? And if you keep it in dollar, I always say, if you keep it in dollar, it's also an investment. You're investing in dollar, you know? Like, so that's also a problem. For sure. But what advice comes to me is like, talk to, like, be open to the feedback from other people. You know, like your friends, they know you very well. And and uh, maybe some people who are very aware, you know, like a professional therapist, you know, or a professional or a, a guide, you know, or like some spiritually advanced person, they might be able to give you really good advice, you know, but you have to be open, open to it, you know. Um, and I think that was lacking a little bit also for me, you know, like first I had the feedback from my friends, then I was so successful, they went out of poker, you know, and I was kind of alone, you know, and alone, you can easily get blind, you know, like, <clears throat> so. Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's similar to a poker hand as well. A lot of like when we're doing the commentary and the, the millions the other day, it's kind of, it's like we get the whole cards up and you see a situation, it's kind of obvious or like you just feel it. But yeah, when you're the one in the hand or in the moment, you're the one dealing with it. You know, it's like someone, if, if you're in a relationship and, you're, and your buddies know the girl's not right for you, but there's nothing they can, it's hard, right? <laughs> to like, they, yeah. you know, like <laughs> what are you going to say? You, know, like, so you just got to <laughs> let, let it play itself. But, but yeah, that's, uh, you know, these things are, these things are tough and it's, uh, it's fun. Give me, give me one of your best memories ever live, uh, whether it was a win or just like a, a time you maybe got a house with buddies at the World Series. Give me like one of your best sort of memories or, or times in poker <laughs> that you can share. Maybe some that you can't share. Oh my god! You know when I won the Star Kids, time, it was so nice. You know we jump in the ocean. You know, and then was all the players, all the players were there. You know. <laughs> that was 2013 I think I just saw it right it's like uh where was this yeah there it is that St. Kitts it was like pretty crazy too because it was literally yeah that October you get a third in a World Series nice score 330 then you go to uh UK so yeah France you or London take it down I remember that one uh that was that was a cool one that was a big one 1.3 and then literally two weeks later in an island yeah you get to win back to back. So, I mean, that's gotta be, that's the peak, right? Is that, is that like the most, the wildest month of poker maybe you've had just like in terms of success and highs, it's televised TV, high coverage, big names, a lot of fun. Yeah, that just the feeling, you know, you're on the beach, you're with all my friends are there drinking, smoking, you know, like I remember the night before the Alpha 8, I went alone, smoke a joint and went into like one of the, these clubs with a, you know like local local kind of clubs and just went nuts like dancing you know and, you know that's how i was rolling like back in the days you know and uh, it, was, it was crazy and all the you know like i was never good with girls you know and stuff like this when i was a teenager and then with poker it developed it developed better and better you know and i have lots of good memories of that of course you know. can't share them now huh? Yeah, yeah, no, I understand. I totally understand. I understand. And tell me, what is your what? I know you've done, you've been involved with charities. You've done a lot. You've been pretty proactive in, in doing that. What is sort of your your goal? Um, you know, what do you see yourself playing poker for a little? You said a little bit in the future, or are you are you sort of in like the full on grind right now? What's your sort of uh, your your thoughts and your your feelings on poker right now? Yeah, no, I don't want to play like too much, you know, um, I don't have the time. And also I feel like my, my energy invested like somewhere else. Like I'm working on a lot of businesses and I want to be involved with the poker community, but from another angle, like from another side. And, and maybe to that conversation, you know, I'm very interested in this new way of doing business where everybody is heard. 
as I said before, you have to listen to your friends, you know. And it's always like the CEO, you know, is the shining figure and everybody listens to him as if he's like God, you know. And I, I think that's a very dangerous, uh, slippery slope, right? And I think the next generation of business is much more uh, open and broader, you know. And I, I'm very interested in these new kind of decentralized ways of doing business. And what do you, do you think, what do you feel the current state of poker is? I mean, obviously you feel you can win. You just, you just want a 60,000 person tournament for 800,000, you know, in the state of the game, do you feel like, is it, cause kind of like, oh, four, oh, five is boom, money maker. Things were crazy. Right. Then sort of like there was a period where it got felt tougher solvers, this and that. Now there's just feels like there's so many content creators there's there's podcasts there's youtube there's twitch there's all this stuff new people are coming in legislation in the u.s is sort of lightning things are coming up like wh wh what's your overall feeling in poker in the moment you're very bullish <laughs> very bullish like man yeah legislation wise it's bullish and also we're shifting as a, as a world also more into things that we like away from this have to do and more into would like to do and many people if they would know poker would like to play it so it's another boom you know it's another boom and I, i'm not seeing it going anywhere you know like it's it's undiable at this point you know what, what's your how and, scalable uh, do you think your agent how, how many people do you think would you like what's your dream like to stable do you want to have 100 guys 200 do you have it set up now you can take as many or, or what is your actual goal with that yeah, technically, I can take uh, uh, a lot of players on. It's a little bit like like a company, you know. It's like now we have a little nice community. <laughs> uh, when it's with hundred guys, it's a different. It needs different structure, different setup, less of personal attention, more rules, and so on. And then if you go two thousand uh, people, it's it's different again, you know. So I want to grow it a bit organically like you know and i have to see how i deal with these things it's new for me too i'm learning a, a lot about this stuff you know and um, i don't know where it's gonna go you know i don't know but is is idea is that sort of the dream this like you got got competent good players so you go they they're at a live event they're at the world series you got 10 20 guys in the main event you got 10 guys in a you know, one of these events, right? Like 150, you're sort of hitting the lottery shot where you know you got like competent, good players and you have now a cushion, a bankroll and you want to try to see like how far you can take it. You figure that they're probably plus CV overall and also sort of, is it, is it, is it more the, is it the ROI of it all or is also maybe the like younger guys that you get, you believe can be winners that you're sort of investing in with them personally? Do you want to have more of a personal relationship where you're, you're involved with them? Uh, on a level of like coaching, you guys do zooms. Can you maybe give me a little bit of a look into how you see this, this like this training or this dynamic going? Like how how involved are you personally? You know, for for me, this is, is very important to help them as a human. You know, it's like I want to help humans and kind of scale it up and make money while doing it to scale it up further. So I have investigated like my whole life, like, okay, how does the human work? How can we, HBO is the name, human potential optimized. So how do we optimize a human being? It's super complex and individual also, you know, and I've spent so much time doing that. And now I want to use that wisdom to bring it to the people, but also to make money off that, right? But that's the real goal of it. And it's, of course, a holistic approach, physical, mentally, uh, emotionally, a complete ap approach, and which I think is much more successful and faster. But that's the real goal, that they can do anything, that they become financially free, emotionally free, and then they will do a fantastic things in their life too. And And what is the... If someone came to you and that you you believe they've got a proven track record, right? Like say they final table on November nine, won a bracelet, whatever, right? You know they 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 can win, right? They have it, but maybe they have some other vices or things that have held them back. What would be a you know what would be a typical deal structure? And and like if someone said, I want to play a World Series event, the main event, five Ks, three Ks, two K, all the whole thing. Like how, how, what a 
what is that process like or how, how can they get in touch with you? Um, we will open up a new round of applications very, very soon. Um, best is just if you follow me on Instagram and then you will see when it's open again. I need to change it a little bit more. Um, so follow me here on Instagram, the real film board, and uh, there's the old application there. I will, uh, <laughs> I will post very soon uh, when it's open again. And I'm happy to uh, get some, get some of you guys and uh, and work on on these things together. Very very cool. And and what about ambassadorship? I see you're rocking a, some patches in the day. I mean, you've obviously had a lot of lot, lot of success over the years. What do you think about content creator? We're we gonna see the real fillboard streaming on Twitch, doing a podcast. You know, you said you kind of we the other day we did the. The show together on the weekly GG Super Millions, and it sort of got you invigorated, even though it was a four hour, right? It's a long, it's a long stream. You know what? Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Are you? Uh, could you become a content content creator? Is that is, is that in the, is that in the works? Yeah, I I really discovered like I really love this podcasting, you know, and commentary podcast. I really like that. Twitch and playing myself that's too much for me. I don't like it too much, and too much consistency required. Um, I don't know where my journey is going to go uh, exactly, besides that stable, you know, but I'm always, I'm not so interested in sharing poker advice, you know, I'm more interested in sharing life advice, and I'm also more comfortable doing that, you know. For sure. And you're... Where are you most active on socials? On you, you like Twitter, Instagram more? What, what's your, what's your? Oh, I don't know, look at that. That's a, uh, it's pretty. There it is, right there. It's pretty insane. Ten mil guaranteed. Wow. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Yeah, this. I mean, that is that's honestly insane. That is such. What was your biggest online score before that? Hmm. Maybe 220, something like that. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. That is, uh, that is, that is, that is, that is really crazy. Honestly, that is that. Yeah, that's, I mean, 800 online from a hundred. I, it's just, it's, it's honestly a little bit, a little bit over. It's, it's just crazy. What was it? Who was with you when it happened? What time was it? You were, that was like not long ago. We're talking like, oh yeah. What? Two months ago or less about two months ago. What, what was the, what, give me like the feeling when it actually, when you won that thing. I mean, it doesn't feel real, right? Like it's pretty crazy. That's got to be a euphoric moment there. What was the winning hand? Was it, was the heads up intense? Was it close? Did you have the chip lead the whole way at that final table? Yeah, super dramatic story. Very dramatic story. I, I got a huge chip lead and then uh, got down, got down again and lost a bit my trust in myself. And my wife was really supporting me uh, here, you know, really, uh, she was with me and supporting me and it, it helped a lot, you know, and uh, I got back into that good vibe and, um, and strong game, you know, and then beat him. And yeah, so I was here in the sundown with my wife and, uh, and her mother, you know, and um, yeah, they, you know, for them, like for the mother, it's hard to believe that it's for real. He, they pay that out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's not, it does. Of course, it doesn't seem real. I, I, it's a, it's funny too. My wife's parents, when I had my biggest score online, I streamed twenty five hours on Twitch, and they don't speak perfect English. And I was still, I was getting married to her in two days. I'm in my my clothes from the night before in their house. She was not in town yet she was coming the next day like getting her wedding dress and doing all her stuff and like i was still there in the morning you know it's eight in the morning they saw me at like 9 p.m when they go to bed i'm in the same chair sitting there playing on the computer they they don't speak they had to think i'm insane like and i've never done that before. you know what i mean I, that was a 25 hour twitch stream i started at like 7 a.m or 8 a.m on the day before and i they knew that too they saw me the whole day eating food you know, bringing me coffee breaks and then they go to bed and I wake up, I'm in the same clothes, marrying their daughter in a day and a half, the poker guy. And they don't know what the hell's going on. Same thing. Right. It's kind of like, it's hard. Like, yeah, they're like, what? And I'm like, no, it's good. It's good. 
I'm here. Yeah. I'm, here I'm still here. Trust me. But like, yeah, it doesn't. It does seem a little crazy, right? It doesn't um, compute with them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's some language barriers and, and and translation stuff, but it's it's fun. I mean, you know, it is it is it is uh, it is it's just a great game. Great memories and great great times. What is um, uh, what would you say um, like? In terms of vacations away, like during in taking breaks, because did you was burnout ever a problem for you during World Series and stuff? Like, give me give me if you go to the World Series this year, let's just say you're able to go or you do go and you you're there from June first till July fifteenth or whatever, right? Six weeks. Give me your what you believe is the most effective for yourself strategy to play everything. Just wake up and play. Pick certain events and play those only. Like, how do you, you know, give me some of the learnings throughout like a World Series schedule for six weeks, how you would recommend for someone to approach it? Or you just say yourself, let's say yourself. Yeah, I would recommend after three weeks, you fly to Cancun <laughs> and you take a one week break and then you go back. And uh, it's really not about the volume. Like, and I became so precise and good at when to take breaks. You know, I've been not playing much like the last five, six years, basically, you know. And I've made basically the same money every year, but with like 10% of the input, you know, because I just learned like, I just learned like, when is the time to play, you know, and when to take breaks and we're trying to teach that in the stable but it's a very tough skill you know and but really like it's so much more important than people think it's like this belief system that especially the germans we have it a lot you have to work hard you have to work hard and mm, it's not true you know you have to work smart you know you have to work smart and a very peak performance uh, and uh, you know, and then our rise are possible that are uh, beyond your expectations. I don't mean my, my 4,000 uh, RI I, I just made, but my RI over the last six years is like before that tournament is incredible, super duper high, you know. And it's because I, I don't play. If I have no chance, I'm not playing. Right. Yeah, it makes, makes a lot of sense. I mean, that is... Um... I, I, that's, it's, it's one of those things, like I said, the attribute card being rested, being focused, being in a good mindset. You know, it's like the same, some guys like you get that mind mentality. Oh, I want to play 20 tables and right, you know, be like a, a rake back grinder or supernova leap back in the day. Right. Versus like, yeah, there's probably guys that, you know, four table play a little higher, play more focused, play better and, and maybe make as much at like one tenth or 12, 20 at the time. Um, this is this is one of those things where it's hard and it's easy to get kind of lost in doing more or you're losing and forcing it or jamming the stakes. So this this is very important. I think the mindset and is that something within your stable that you're working on? Is that there is is there actually like a mindset coach? Do they, is there a program where you're spending time uh, where people in terms of the mentality of it or, you know, having rules like if you if you're losing or take a break or play, you know, take days off? Like what, what kind of uh, do you have sort of a curriculum or a sort of a uh criteria on how you see the, that going for each player do you let each player dictate their own we have an amazing uh mindset coach on board lee davy you might know him as well oh, yeah yeah lee great guy he's been on the podcast. Doing, uh, commentating and uh, interviews and so on but he's a very advanced coach and he's a shareholder also of the stable so uh, he's doing a lot of work and has his own program that people can run through Highly recommend them if you can afford a, <laughs> a high hourly. Um, and yeah, really nice program. And that is one part. The other part is like we're not pushing so much on volume. We're not saying, hey, guys, you have to play 400, 500 tournaments a month, you know. Um, I don't know how we're going to handle it when it grows bigger, but definitely no, not, not such a pressure on that, you know. Right. Makes, makes really, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I think that, yeah, qua the quality over quantity definitely for the, for the, for ease of uh, organization also. And I think it's more less stressful. I think that, you know, that, that mindset of waking up and playing every tournament in the lobby, just registering, not having a plan, you know, versus, all right, here's today. This is what I'll play. If something doesn't go well, I have this as a backup, not overdoing it. What about screens? Like 
Have you, uh, tables, do you have a recommendation for tournament online grinding? Like what do you believe is the optimal amount of tables to play? Uh, if you're, if you're playing, what do you like to play? It depends a little bit on, on the person. Some, some are better at it and some are not yeah. so good. We have an hour stable, uh, now you can start with, you can have the first couple of hours, you can have 10 tables and then, uh, not open anymore as soon as they get deeper. I think that's a huge mistake many people do. They have like, they start with 10 and then they have five who are a little bit deeper and then they open up another five, like hundred, uh, like small stakes, first level, you know, like makes no sense. If you're playing 10, 20 blinds on the right, it doesn't make sense to play 50 cent, $1 blinds on the, on the left, you know, just to get your volume in, you know, focus on that game. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, I will say myself personally, that's one thing I would do differently is back, you know, streaming on Twitch as well adds, I don't know how to like calibrate it, how many more tables, but to carry, you know, doing, doing eight tables or 10 tables and then streaming, it's silly. And then to your point is like, all right, if some go away, now you're like deeper and you're in the moment, you kind of know what's happening. You're in that zone on those tables, even if there's only four left versus like, yeah, just fire new ones because those seems like never those sessions never really go well. It's like and then it never ends. But the ones I've had success in, it's like <laughs> and I have one or two tables left, right? And I focused on those, and like those are the ones that go well. But right, yeah. Does it matter? You know, you're gonna fire a hundred dollar tournament when you have a five hundred or a one k with three tables left. Do you want to add, you know, five more tables of two hundred dollar, you know, five k to first tournaments when you're playing for a hundred thousand? It uh, yeah, it doesn't make sense. And that is a I think a very common, I'd say mistake, I'd call it a mistake, but just sort of a miscalculation that is just a, you know, it's, it's also what's the reason you're doing it? Is it, yeah, is it for your volume? Is it because you just love playing so much? But why? Because it's actually, if you were to know that it's not the profitable, the best thing to do, then, you know, you shouldn't do it. But I think that's a, that's good advice. And I actually haven't heard it said that way, but that is, um, you know, that's a, that is a good, good thing there to, to do. And, and, and I, I like that. I really like you think that. about it without any energy considerations and deeper things. Like if you're playing a weak player, let's say you're half deep in the tournament, you're playing a weaker player, you, you know he's a bit weaker. You're making like 10 big blinds uh, per hundred against him, let's say. If you would play like five days with him, you would make like 40 big blinds against him because you know exactly what he's doing. So if you give it attention and you see, oh, he's that kind of a player and he does this thing and he gives this tell away, you know, you're making very quickly against him like 40 big blinds. Right. Yeah. I mean, you're missing blind on blind spots. You're missing low hanging, you know, shoves, reject, and all just all these things that are like kind of intuitive that, you know, or, are, 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 you know, like that's what impressed me though. There are guys that can do it though, like Mormon or, whatever right you can name guys at multi-table and they've done it forever and they're just like really able to play like that but I, I you have to know yourself and i don't think i'd say the vast majority of players cannot operate yeah. at a high level with the i don't think they watch like replays you know they watch like replay what this guy did and so on and really following uh, really following the action you know? yeah and yes uh completely agree and then uh, you mentioned you're working on inner peace. How does that desire affect you playing poker? Does it make you play better? Do you feel like that this this sort of looking for inner peace is that is that something that you you spoke on this before? <clears throat> it helped me so much. This is how I made all my money. You know, this is how I got interested in whole, the whole yoga and spirituality was when I discovered oh this shit works. You know. And uh, the, 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 the yoga as a preparation or the breathing, I'm, I'm a huge fan of different breathing techniques, right? I have one, if I'm feeling a bit shaky, I'm doing a certain type of breath. If I feel a bit unbalanced, I do another type. If I feel tired, I do another type of breathing. Just like one minute, you know, I can do it while playing or in a five minute break. And it's been so uh, successful, you know? And... Uh, yeah, which which breathing method which is is there like a is it a is it a is it a curriculum is it is it something you self-taught or did where did you learn these different breathing methods and where can people find those hmm, yeah it's a little, you have to investigate a little bit it's not like one one easy trick you know <clears throat> um, trade secrets trade secrets it, it's part of the 
part of the the state the backing deal is uh, you get some breathwork stuff right <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah we have breathwork coaches also already for the for the stable you know but yeah uh, okay uh for the, the guys here wim hof start with wim hof wim hof yeah the Hof method, you know, with the ice pool, and uh, but he has a certain type of breathing technique also going on, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, there's a really huge potential, huge power. I love the breathing exercises, you know. You can do very deep breathing and we get into very uh, nice states also, which I I did a lot like that. <clears throat> very cool. I I'm, I again, I think there's a lot with that. It's also, you know, I think about meditation a lot, where I. I don't do it every day and I don't actually, there's times where I don't do it for many days or even a month or two of doing it. And I think that's a very, it's all, it's an awareness thing as well. It's more about like the, because I, I find it difficult to be, you know, present and focused. Like when I sit down right now, if I took 10 minutes and I try to like count, you know, do the thing where I'm like one up backwards counting or just try to think of nothing. But I think it's more, the actual principle and the practice of doing nothing and being it's like if you don't have 10 minutes or 15 minutes 20 minutes to like in your day that you're able to like sit down and just do nothing i think it's more of like a alert that like you're doing too much you know what i mean if you're scheduling back-to-back -back stuff you just got stuff everywhere and obviously with kids you know and and other responsibilities and the more it comes at your at you it's harder to find that that personal time or like oh okay i want to work out you know, I want to do this. I want to spend time with my wife. But like, it is important to be able to, to take a little you time. Cause I know myself, like a lot of times I wake up, I'm in bed and I'm already on my phone. My screen time's insane. Like from the time I go to bed or when I wake up till I go to bed, it's like, bam, I'm not out of bed before a lot of times I see my phone. And then it's like, all right, email, discord, you know, whatever, Snapchat, e uh, telegram, my gram, your gram, Instagram, Twitter, <laughs> messages everywhere. Right. And then, yeah. and then you think, you can't get out of the thing because you're in Slack. You message one person, you go to this thing, you got messages here. Like you literally could be in a ping pong Tetris, like messaging the whole day. If you, if you, if you, yeah, I mean, you're doing so much, you're doing so many things, Jam, and you're doing a great job. I would go nuts with this volume, you know? <laughs> I, I'm, I, I think a bit of tell, talking out loud, trying to talk myself through it. Cause no, there are times where I'm wondering, you know, is it, is it, is it, uh, yeah, but it's also you try to find processes. You try to find team and, and delegate and, and do your best. But like, you know, yeah. yeah, there is a there is a bit where it's it's like I think it's also very important to say no. Do you have a hard time with that ever? Or, or do you feel like you're able to kind of tell people just no and take your own time? Because that is hard, too. If you always say yes to everything that's asked, whether it's your family, friends, wife, this, that, the other, it's like it can easily be too much. Do you, do you find a hard time with that or no to just do things you want to do? Yeah. Shifted. I was a lot like, yes, yes, everything. And then I, I had a, the baby and then you become so strong with no. Uh, since I have a, a baby, I'm like, no, I don't have time. Like, no, 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 clearly, you know. And that was a big gift from becoming a father, you know, that I was clearly like, this is for me and this is not for me, you know. Um, yeah. Right. Well, that's, that's exactly, that's a big, that's a big thing. If you're able to say, look, I'm going to do this or I'm going to spend that time with my, my child. Right. Yeah. It's uh it's kind of a, it makes it easier to just like to say, is that zoom call? Is this presentation? Do I want to listen to this thing or be on a, you know, do I need to do this or do I want to enjoy the time? So I think that's a, that is, that is a very, very powerful thing. Well, you know, Phil, I do want to, I do want to, you know, we got, I want to do a review of your final table. I think that would be very cool to get that. So I know Philippe Mojave, mm -hmm. we had tried to just real quick find it. He did it though, right? He definitely did it. So we will, we will find his footage. If nothing else with the whole cards up, I think it was one of the, one of these videos who's Philippe Ramos, also part of, part of uh, team GG, a good friend of mine. So we'll, we'll have to get that content, that footage and go through it. How many hours was that? Do you remember the actual final table? How long did it last? Three or four? Uh, um, two hours, maybe. Two hours. Okay. So listen, we've done it all. We've done the G we did the commentary. We're doing the podcast. We're gonna do the we'll do the hand review. We'll make some fun stuff with that at some point coming up. And you know, of course, we're Bernie Man buddies. You were there and I met my wife. I got a lot of a lot of love for you. I know you're a great guy and you and you've uh, got a big future and you're giving back in many ways, including this new stable. So guys, please make sure for Phil you give him a follow on Instagram. And that is is that the that's the way you're saying that's the best way, people. There will be some a new process and applications for, for new people to come on? 
Yes, guys, come and follow me on Instagram. No spam, you know, I'm trying to, I'm not posting much, but I try to really keep the quality high, you know, and uh, yeah, come join me. Come join the journey. Come get some breath work. Get a mental coach in there. It seems, sounds like a good package. Uh, it, yeah, I, I like it. I love. I love what's going on. Congrats on that 800k score. Uh, and again, yeah. man, uh, much love. And we appreciate you coming on. Again, this podcast is brought to you by Club GG, where you can join for free, play poker with your friends, and win hundreds of thousands of dollars in prizes. And Phil, we will be doing more content very soon. This is podcast number 184. It's in the books. Follow Phil on socials. Check him out. Talk to him, reach out to him. And if you are an aspiring poker player that has some, you know, some results and some some credibility, they are looking for applications. So to, to join a stable. And again, you can look at his illustrious tr- career, a lot of titles, 11 million plus in live earnings, a lot of wins online and knows his stuff and, and knows knows how to live life. So Phil, thank you for the time. And I appreciate it, my friend. We'll be we'll be hanging again soon. Thank you guys. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jeff. Cheers. All right, everyone, we'll see you next week for another podcast. Appreciate it. And, of course, Tuesday, Super Millions on YouTube, the GG Poker channel. It will be 245 Eastern. I got Dan, Jungleman, Cates on for the next guest. We will see you there.